Four years ago, soon after taking office as China's senior most leader, Xi Jinping put forth his grand vision for China. He called it the Chinese dream, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And in our very first Closer to China show two years ago, we highlighted the Chinese dream. I described it in five dimensions, national, personal, historical, global, and antithetical, meaning tensions between different parts of the dream. What's been happening over the past four years? How has fulfilling the dream been progressing? What are the obstacles or challenges? What's the relationship between national rejuvenation and people's happiness? To reflect on these questions, I went back to Pudong, where we produced our first show. Pudong exemplifies the Chinese dream, bringing us closer to China. China's financial hubs, Silicon Valley, Medicine Valley, and the first Disneyland on the Chinese mainland. These are all located in Pudong, Shanghai. Pudong originally referred only to the less developed land across the Wangpu River from Shanghai's old city. Now Pudong is the largest contributor to the city's GDP growth. Over the past 25 years, it has maintained a steady and relatively high rate, averaging just under 10% annually. I speak with three leading figures of Pudong. Zhao Zhizheng was vice mayor of Shanghai and head of the Pudong New Area and minister of the State Council Information Office. In Jie is vice president and provost of Shanghai Tech University, and Chen Li is co-founder and CEO of Hua Medicine. The phrase, the Chinese dream, Zheng Guomeng, didn't really exist when you first began working here in the early 1990s. But go back to that time. Put yourself in that environment, that way of thinking, when you first had the assignment to build Pudong. What was your dream at that time, at the very first time that you heard that you were going to be responsible for Pudong? What was your dream at that time? My dream was to build up economic zones comparable to those in New York, Paris or London so that we can communicate with them on an equal footing and promote continuous exchanges in terms of the information, talents, finance and so on. This was my vision at the beginning. Now, 20 years later, I can say my vision has been basically realized. Pudong's economic structure is quite modernized, high-tech oriented with quality service. Therefore, Devang has not only energized the development of Shanghai, but also boosts the advancement of the entire nation. Has the success of Pudong surprised you? Its pace of development has exceeded my expectations, but its success is as I expected. Its rapidity and soundness owes much to the devotion and the wisdom of the Chinese people. Zhangjiang in Pudong is dubbed China's Medicine Valley. One of three new drugs developed in China is developed here. Long testing periods, huge investments, high risks are common in drug development, which makes it almost impossible for startups. Ten years ago, service-oriented labs were built to provide technological support to newly established companies. And a complete operational innovation chain was also established, covering each phase of drug development, from pharmacological evaluation to clinical research and registration. Now there are over 500 innovative medicine enterprises operating well, here. You, uh, Among them is Dr. Li Chen's company. Here. It has more than 20 people. But in 2015, it received a venture capital investment of 25 million U.S. dollars. It doesn't have a lab, but it's at the forefront of research and development in diabetic medicine. We are expecting within the 13th five-year plan time frame, we'll have our drug launched in China. And then this is going to be the first launch in, in the whole world. And I think this is going to be the first time a world first-in-class drug with novel mechanism, new chemical structure, 
and then all the major clinical trials done in China, launching in China, before anywhere else. What policies in particular were attractive that the government uh, uh, put in place? When I first came to Zhangjiang, right, before I even had the office, the government rent me a office space with a you know, 100 square meter and say, hey, it's free for you to use, yeah. right, kill you, settle down, right? Basically, this is the way they say, hey, John Yang, we are working on innovation. We like the people, you know, continue to be able to develop here. So the infrastructure supporting is one thing. So uh, the other part is the programs where they have, you know, the grants from the Zhangjiang uh, High Tech Park and also from Pudong governments and then that also linked it up with Shanghai government. So environment-wise, financial-wise, serve a basic foundation. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the resources, right? We are surrounded by the hospital, right? Researchers in Puxi, right? And then major disease area expertise, KOLs, and then the drug discovery development scientists in the university and, and the academia institutions in, in, in Shanghai. Development of Pudong has overtaken that of many other districts in Shanghai. Its economic volume accounts for the lion's share of the whole city while making great contributions to taxation. It attracts more than half of the total foreign capital investment in Shanghai. But as the land gets more limited and wages rise, projects may not appeal to foreign capital which seeks the highest returns. High-tech foreign companies may still love to come as Shanghai enjoys sound industrial bases and prosperous support industries. Many disciplines at Shanghai's universities are high-tech oriented, so it has its unique advantages. In the future, most foreign companies may share this commonality of being high-tech oriented. In terms of science and technology, we emphasize innovation instead of imitation. China's innovation in science and technology is conducted through cooperation with scientists and high-tech companies around the world. While we say our innovation, we're not indicating that we refuse cooperation. Rather, we emphasize the leading role of the Chinese people. Therefore, we hope foreign friends will not misunderstand us. To investigate the challenges China faces, to explore cutting-edge research areas and high-tech industries, and to put their innovative and entrepreneurial ideas into action, these are what students of this newly built university are encouraged to do. Shanghai Tech University officially opened in 2013. It's a small-scale research university of academic excellence. What is the contribution of Shanghai Tech as a new university to the fulfillment of the Chinese dream? Our vision is mainly two things. One is we try to, we try to serve the uh, transformation of the economy of China or even the Chinese dream, fulfill of the Chinese dream by providing more results on science and technology, not only the applied also the fundamental, uh, and uh, this is one thing. So we select the uh, imp very important uh, uh, issues uh, which challenge the development of the country, for example, energy-related, environmental-related, uh, aging problem, health problem, these kind of things. The second, uh, we can serve the country, uh, educate more talented young people and that there will be the future. Science technology is a means to an end in the economy, but it's an end in itself, the beauty and the cultural significance of new discoveries and, and, and new benefits. And that's good for China and good for the world. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, although a lot of fundamental research eventually will transform the one day to some applied, uh, uh, you know, to serve the society. When you go back to the history of science, a lot of fundamental research at the beginning you don't know uh, what's the use of it? But uh, eventually, uh, for example, the founding of uh, electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fundamental research. No one knows what would happen after that. But uh, then the world was changed by this uh, discovery. And uh, 
So I think uh, this is one of the reasons we need to uh, strongly support the fundamental research. Another reason, of course, uh, we do need to understand the world more, to give more contribution to the, uh, uh, to the knowledge of the human beings and uh, what, is, uh, what is happening uh, in the world. That may not necessarily contribute to the economy in the future. But uh, that's important for the development of the human beings. This startup company was established in 2012, the same year President Xi Jinping put forth the Chinese dream. The company aims to develop revolutionary biomedical optical devices. In less than a year, this startup developed China's first vein detecting device. It's not just smaller, it also has faster response times at a stronger function. It doesn't just help you see the vein, you can also tell the depth. And now, Ju's company has created the world's thinnest endoscope, an instrument used to visualize the interior of hollow body areas. The third generation of our product shows that we are no longer following the suit of our international competitors. We are leading the trend. By the end of 2015, there were over 25,000 technology incubators in China. As Chinese people's socioeconomic status has improved, they are seeking greater opportunities to fulfill individual dreams and realize personal values. Besides achieving prosperity for the country and rejuvenation of the nation, the notion of the Chinese dream also stresses happiness for the citizens. Yang Xiaoming was the general manager of three major state-owned enterprises, and he knows that people are the core of social progress. I think changes in construction in the future may not be as seismic as that of the last 20 years. However, people's perceptions, their cultural identity and social historic views may still embrace great changes. I think changes in our search for knowledge are the most important. In the past, we had a limited understanding of modern cities. For example, at the beginning, we only advocated the building of skyscrapers. To give you an idea, Lutia Tui District was originally designed to be a place fit for vehicle passage. But as we developed, we found the importance of being people-oriented. We have to serve the needs and convenience of the people. So we then exerted great effort to upgrade people's actual needs matter more. What were the biggest challenges or obstacles that you faced in building Pudong and Dujasue, and how can we learn from those um, uh, experiences? Uh, how can we learn how better to achieve the Chinese dream today? In the early days, we prioritized the development of the hardware and the infrastructure since they required a lot from our knowledge system and needed a lot of learning effort. But as the skyscrapers were erected, we gradually realized that upgrading people's minds as well as modernizing the economy and culture created even bigger challenges and accounted for more value. The biggest challenge concerns our people. We lack experience and international talents in terms of development. How should we conquer the challenge? Well, first, we must send people abroad on exchange visits. Second, we invite experts to Budong to teach through speeches. At first, we knew little about modern economic operations. Say, we didn't even know the wide Western model of BOT, that's Build, Operate, Transfer. So we stepped up our learning and strengthened our exchanges with foreign experts. On being people-oriented and seeking for people's benefits, another important topic is how to turn farmers into citizens. Normally, urbanization takes a protracted length of time. Not for Pudong, which basically completed urbanization within just one decade. To address the lack of talented people, we could initiate foreign countries. But to address the employment issue for the locals, we needed to offer great help. 
Therefore, we not only tried to urbanize them, but also tried to train high-caliber talents with great efforts. These were our solutions in trying to combat the challenge. The ultimate goal of economic development is people's welfare. Now there are over 12,000 registered social organizations in Shanghai, covering areas like education and health, environmental protection, public security, the disabled, the elderly, and the like. More than a decade ago, to provide support services to the growing not-for-profit sector, Dr. Zhuang Ailing founded this center. No matter how many high scrapers and how much high of the GDP is, but uh, the purpose of the economic development actually is to strive for the social development, for the human development. The mission of the, the, the non-profit sector is to meet the needs of the people, especially the social disadvantaged groups. I hope that the sector of philanthropy in China can play a leading role in the world. My Chinese dream is that when my parents are 60 years old or 70 years old, they will not be bothered by tuberculosis. My Chinese dream is to have a real artificial intelligence, computers that really think like human. What's the relationship uh, in the Chinese dream of the national dream, the rejuvenation of the country, and the personal dream that people seek their own happiness? If we only help the country realize its dreams without tending to the dreams of the people, then essentially we're not successful in fulfilling the Chinese dream. Because the dream of a country and the dreams of the majority of the people should be realized together through progress together. In this way, every individual can get more motivated and the country can enjoy ultimate glory. Therefore, we all believe that the dream of a country and the dream of individuals are closely related. How can other regions of China, not necessarily Beijing and Shenzhen, which are already developed, but other regions that are much less developed, what are the kinds of principles that you would advise other regions to apply that you use so successfully in Pudong, even though the, the environment here is so different than other places? I'm fully aware of the differences across regions. To copy and paste Pudong's experiences would not work in other regions. Rather, we should pay attention to some basic ideas. First, the development of every place calls for catering to local conditions. The macro plans go hand in hand with micro progress. As we developed Pudong, we were faced with choices. For example, when we tried to design a football pitch, it would require a completely different size and scale from that set up for the World Cup, for national competitions, or just for matches in Pudong district. Therefore, we came up with two concepts. One is called functional design, and the other is form design. What is functional design? Well, it means design based on the function of a building. We have to consider whether it is to serve as a hotel, a multinational headquarter, or a bank. Therefore, functional design precedes form design. Being function-oriented prevents the capital from being splashed over in vain. From your perspective as a scholar of international relations, uh, what are the elements of the Chinese dream that have an international component in terms of China's image in the world, China's diplomacy, China's engagement with the world? How important is the international component to fulfilling the Chinese dream? Well, we learn from the American dream, but go beyond that. There are three aspects of the Chinese dream. I would like to translate, firstly, as a Chinese dream, as a people. We are the same, human being, like the Americans want to be happiness, get rich, right? That's the same. Secondly, China is not a nation state. China is a civilization state. So we are thinking about of the revival of their civilization. Like a Belt and Road Initiative, recall many Asian 
countries also, you know, the prosperity of the greatness of the civilization like Iran, of the uh, Europeans. Certainly, that's something different. Uh, China, we say Chinese nation, it's not a one nation. We have a 56 ethnic groups. So this is a Chinese dream, not Chinese people, Chinese nation with a strong prosperity and state, state power, power more and more powerful of the state, of the nation, civilization, uh, revival. Th three levels of that. So I said China dream, Chinese dream, and the Chonghua dream. Chinese dream as a people, China dream as a nation, as, as a country, and the Chonghua dream as a civilization. We first spoke about the Chinese dream almost three years ago, which was on the first anniversary of when President Xi Jinping announced it. And that turned out to be our very first show of Closer to China. Now we're almost three years later. How has your understanding of the Chinese dream become enriched and enlarged over the last three years? Uh, to realize the Chinese dream, we need two conditions. One is the hard work of the Chinese people, and the other is a sound environment. Therefore, the Chinese attach great importance to peace in the world. They are willing to contribute to peace in Asia and beyond. However, there are a lot of undercurrents lurking around in the international environment. Asia is not that peaceful either. Therefore, on the one hand, we work hard towards our dreams on our own. On the other hand, we contribute to peace around the world in various ways to undertake our responsibilities in the world arena. But yet some countries see the Chinese dream as something that could uh, turn in for other countries something less than a dream, that to the degree the Chinese dream is successful means that other countries are uh, put in a lower position. Um, and so how do you uh, react when you hear foreigners worry that the Chinese dream for China will be uh, a negative for other countries? China has a very good initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative, which encourages Chinese companies to go abroad instead of only minding their own business interests. When it comes to developing countries that enjoy a good relationship with China, while the intimacy is not yet fully in place, we're still willing to offer what we excel in, infrastructure in particular, within the big context of a market economy. This is not out of any political intentions, rather we hope for more mutual understanding through such cooperation. Therefore we have set up the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Silk Road Fund, as well as several private organizations to study the differences between China and the rest of the Belt and Road countries to find out where we can complement each other for best results. Therefore it makes no sense to compare our initiative to the Marshall Plan which carried strong political implications. In China, we have no such political prerequisite. We only seek for win-win through cooperation to build up bilateral and multilateral relations. It's not a Chinese solo, but rather a choir for all countries. Let's get tuned to one melody and fill in the lyrics that appeal to all. Some foreigners would interpret the Chinese dream for China as a China threat to them. They see China's uh, economic growth uh, rising and uh, uh, trade uh, imbalances where China is selling more goods than it's importing. They see China dramatically expanding its military, multiple aircraft carriers uh, planned for the future. Um, what do you say to people externally who worry that the Chinese, Chinese dream for China is a China threat to them. China's development accounts for the major idea of the Chinese dream. It represents the hopes of all Chinese and makes the most sincere and plain expression of that Chinese dream. We shall continuously promote its progress. We know that in the past, some countries bullied others as they themselves sought for development. 
However, in China's historic tradition, we value peace and never have any interest in bullying others. There is simply no such past in China's history. For instance, Pudong's development is not targeted to threaten foreign countries in the least sense. On the contrary, it is to strengthen the cooperation in between. When Pudong Airport was first constructed, foreigners asked us what the benefit was. I replied, when there was only one airport in the world, airplanes meant little to us. When there was only one telephone in the world, telephones were of no use. So constructing a large airport in Pudong means great benefits to airlines in all countries around the globe. And those foreign friends readily accepted my explanation. The Chinese dream is interpreted with both positive feedback and misunderstandings. What kind of impacts will the rejuvenation of China bring to us all? America suspects that China threatens to overtake its domination in the world order and is challenging its authority. But we have no such intention at all. It's all their own idea. As a matter of fact, the world order has been gradually changing since World War II. It may not remain the same. Even if China does not take other countries into consideration, it has to bear in mind that others' policies towards China have been changing and certainly form a part of the world order. Revolution in the world order is inevitable, but the Chinese dream never contains any threat to America or other countries. We never seek to reshape an order that only accords with the interests of China, while going against those of others. I hope our foreign friends can understand. China has always been a country that advocates peace, harmony, gentleness and reconciliation. It is our national tradition. Sorry that he has to be interpreted and explained with a great deal of English words. Peace, harmony, gentleness, friendliness and so on, which are all reflected through this single Chinese character. Realizing the Chinese dream comes in stages. About 2020 for a moderately prosperous society and about 2050 for a fully modernized nation. Here's how the five dimensions of the Chinese dream are tracking. National dream, comprehensively deepening reform, promoting rule of law, and strictly governing the party. Personal dream, healthcare and education are being reformed and poverty is being eradicated. Historical dream, the Belt and Road Initiative, helping to develop some 60 countries is inspired by the ancient Silk Road. Global dream, China is increasing its participation in international bodies, even creating new institutions like the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Antithetical dream, green development of highest importance. Pudong exemplifies the Chinese dream by balancing national, personal, and global dreams. In November, at a commemoration marking the 150th anniversary of the birth of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, China's revolutionary founder, Xi Jinping said that the best tribute to Dr. Sun was to continue the pursuit of a rejuvenated China. That's closer to China.